around and and introduce ourselves and just kind of tell us your tie into the community. And we'll start with you, Sylvia. Hi, my name is Sylvia Santiago. I'm a town uh, council person, uh, and I'm also a board of education member for the Newburgh School School District. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, Ms. Briscoe Perez. <clears throat> Hello everyone. So I am Syria Briscoe Perez. I am a town resident. I also work for the Newburgh and Arch City School District. I am a building principal. It's nice to see you, Ms. Santiago. Uh, <laughs> so glad that we are on the same um on this committee together and I'm excited to be here. So thanks uh, for having me. It's good that I know some faces uh also in addition to Ms. Santiago. Ms. Um, Pastor Sean and um, and Chief Daw, so I've known for some time. So excited to be here. Okay, thank you, Pastor Bagnano. How are you, um, Pastor Anthony Moniano for Encounter Church, and um, also the director of the Encounter Compassion Food Pantry. It's run for the uh, county and mainly for the town of New Windsor. We appreciate your help with that food pantry, there, Pastor. Yeah, thank you. It's going really well. Good. Yeah, I know. I've followed up on it. Good, good for you and thank you. Uh, Mr. Hubbard. James Hubbard. Is he muted, John? Yes. Forgive me, I forgot to unmute myself. Good evening, everyone. I have been a uh, resident of New Windsor for approximately uh, 35, uh, 32 years uh, with my wife, two children, uh, six grandchildren. I am a former uh, vet and graduated from a SUNY uh, college and uh, have about 35 years of insurance uh, experience uh, after, after retiring in uh, 2011. Within the community, uh, food ministry and other organizations, and I'm happy to say that um, I am a opponent uh, not an opponent, but I'm an advocate of the Second Amendment and a strong advocate of excellent policing. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah, thanks for your service there, Mr. Hubbard. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Alana Harris. Hi, uh, my name is Alana Harris. I'm a college student. I currently, I'm a resident of New Windsor and um, I've worked in the community. I've worked, um, at the summer camp um, down um, the rack, and I also worked on the weekends at like the concession stand for the rack. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you helping us out, Mr. Neil Fernandez. <clears throat> Good evening, all. My name is Neil Fernandez. I'm a New Windsor resident for 21 years. Um, I reside in Butter Hill Estates with my wife Kathy. Uh, we raised <coughs> sons who have graduated, gotten married. I am a local one elevator constructor. I'm employed by an elevator. I'm also an elevator inspector. Um, and I'm happy to be part of this committee. Thank you. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Mr. Schmidt Davis. Yes, thank you so much for uh, having me be part of this committee. Um, my wife and I have been assistant pastors at Solid Rock Church for eight years now. And one of our main roles is working with students in middle and high school. Um, among other things, but we've had the honor of working with uh, the youth in our community for several years now. Okay, Pastor, thank you very much for participating with us. Dr. Sarah Ruback. Hi, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Sarah Ruback. I'm the Assistant Executive Director of St. Christopher's, and I'm really excited to be meeting members of our community and serving on this committee. So thank you for having me. Thank you, Doctor. Appreciate you helping out. Uh, Mr. Randy Cyper. Yes, good evening, Randy Cyper. I apologize for the video. I'm having a problem with my computer at the moment. But I'm a defense attorney and I live in New Windsor, New York. All right, thank you for participating. Do anybody else pop in, John? Yes, uh, Stuart from Who? Stuart. Who? Yes. Oh, Stuart Rosenwell. How are you, Stu? Good. I'm sorry for being a little bit late. No I, I didn't realize I didn't realize I had to download some uh, <laughs> something to get this to work, but. In any event, I'm Stuart Rosenwasser. I'm a special counsel to David Hoogler, a district attorney of Orange County. And in accordance with the governor's guidance, a uh, representative of the district attorney's office, 
uh, is asked to be on the committees of every municipality uh, who has a, or which has a police department. So we've been busy around the county since there are 31 plus the Orange County Sheriff's Office. Uh, so I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, I've been an attorney uh, here in Orange County uh, for, uh, let me see, uh, maybe 43, 44 years. Uh, I uh, started with the DA's office here at the end of my career. I'm back with the DA's office. I served as an Orange County Court judge and acting Supreme Court judge uh, during my career. And I'm happy to be here and to be of any as assistance that the committee uh, uh, wants to put me to. All right. I appreciate you. Good to see you again, by the way. Yeah. Oh, Hardy. Officer Hardy. Good evening, everyone. Took me a while. Officer to Hardy is the patrolman with our police department, and he's currently assigned to the Washington School District. Is that right? Correct. All right. Appreciate you showing up and help us out tonight. Listen, I am George Myers, in spite of what it says up there, our crack ID department. <laughs> IT department. I have a little trouble with my name. <laughs> We're here because of uh, the Governor Cuomo's June 12th Executive Order 203 requiring each local government to adopt a policing reform plan by April 1, 2021. There are about 500 police departments in New York State, and each local government has to convene stakeholders, which you folks are now, for the <clears throat> fact-based and honest dialogue regarding public safety and need, needs of the community. So the police, to do their job, to protect the public and meet the community's acceptance. So there has to be some collaboration. So we've been slowed down a little bit by COVID and put us a little bit behind because like everybody else, we are suffering. But some of the things that the governor had in his order was review the needs of the community served by its police agency, evaluate the department's current policies and practice, establish policies that allow, allow police to effectively and safely perform their duties, involve the entire community in the discussion, develop policy recommendations resulting from this review, offer a plan for public comment, present the plan to the local legislative body to ratify and adopt it, and certify adoption of the plan to the state budget director on or before April 1st. So I'll just kind of give a something brief that I am the town supervisor since 2020, was a town supervisor before from 1994 to 2005. I have a master's degree in public administration. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice. I um, was a major troop commander in the New York State Police for 25 years. I supervised three to 400 troopers and, and investigative personnel. I taught criminal justice in colleges and uh, high schools in the area. Um, I kind of spend a lot of time with the, with the police department and in particular the police chief. I have always seen my job, first and foremost, is the safety of the community. So I am deeply involved with the police department. I meet with the police chief at least two or three times a day. I'm very interested in what goes on. Um, to me, it, it's a two-way street. There's, there's trust and respect has to go both ways. So um, it's a difficult job today, um, and we're happy to have a, a very professional police department in our view, and that's why we're here with you folks to see kind of how you see what we're doing. So there's a few things that we have done recently that probably the police chief is going to touch on, but we just started today a trial period with body cameras for all our police officers. We have 50 of them. They're in play right now. We have developed a policy, and um, we're kind of on our way. And I think that those police uh, body cams serve a dual purpose. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's he said, she says, eliminated. You go to the video, and you see what what – uh, what actually happened. So it was, fortunately for us, we had some of our local businesses make donations. So we spent about $36,600 on these body cams. And so far we've taken in about $24,000 in donations. And there's another big donation hanging out there that I'm expecting to get in the next week or so. So that certainly took the uh, onus off the taxpayers. So that's just a little overview for me, but I, and I'm going to turn it over to our police chief, Robert Doris, and uh, he can cover this in a whole lot more detail than I can. Robert? Yes, good evening, everybody, and, and thank you for being part of the 
panel along with me. I think it's going to be a good partnership um, right from the start. I could tell um, some familiar faces certainly here and a lot of professionals and that's what we're all about here. So, so let me just start off by a little uh, background on myself for those of you who don't know. Um, I'm going on 24 years with the New Windsor Police Department. Uh, before I started in New Windsor, I had two years with the Sheriff's Office. So I have quite a bit of experience. I moved up through the ranks through the police department, which if you know anything about the police departments in the county, it's becoming kind of rare to see that. Um, a lot of police agencies in the county are hiring outsiders to come in and lead their agencies. So um, we're kind of the exception. And I think that's part of the excellence of the department. I spent 16 years as a Sergeant here, which is really the pivotal position of leadership in the organization because they're the ones that are out on the street making those decisions in the middle of the night that really can um, change people's lives you know as the police chief i come in later now to, to to look at things but as a sergeant you're there at the time making those calls and it's a really important position i spent a long time doing that and i'm not that far removed i've been police chief for about two and a half years now so I still have a very good feeling of what's going on on the street here today, even in these changing times. I graduated from Washingtonville, so I'm a local boy. I uh, have a college degree. I'm a FBI National Academy graduate. That's the um, premier law enforcement leadership school in the nation. It's located in Virginia. Um, that was a great experience. I was fortunate to be able to be invited there. I grew, I grew up in Beaver Dam Lake. A lot of you know that area of town. Uh, it's funny, the officers that come on to New Windsor who didn't grow up in Beaver Dam, it's, it might as well be China to them, wants to learn the roads out there and, and learn the, the, the streets, but um, I'm familiar with them and, and, and we make sure it's safe out there. So I'm 47 years old, I'm married with two kids and I'm, I'm from the area. So I have a vested interest in this panel, not only as the police chief, uh, but as a community member myself, and, that, and that's something I, I hold dear and dear to my heart. So what, are the, what do I bring to the table as a leader? Um, I think a few things that are important. First, uh, certainly is my kindness, my understanding. I think I'm very fair and in respect. Uh, no matter who I deal with, it's going to be respectful, whether it's an employee or a community member, and that starts from the top on down. So I demand, I'm a very demanding leader. I expect a lot from my employees. Um, I expect excellence. Um, and that comes through training, through experience and, and, and the organization itself. Um, everybody here knows they're to treat people with respect and dignity and everybody gets treated fairly. Um, I accept nothing less than that. Uh, I take a lot of pride in what I do. I think that shows and I think the other employees in the organization see that and, and it's leading by example. Um, I, we've had some pretty high profile arrests recently. And I think that, you know, the principles here are integrity and that nobody's above the law. And when we're called upon to do our job, we're gonna do it. So I want everybody on the panel to understand that. Integrity is high here. Um, the people in New Windsor who are very accustomed to a very high level of police service, uh, they, they deserve nothing less than that. And it's my responsibility to make sure that service is delivered every day. And I take that very seriously. Um, we're very fortunate. We have a very good town board that equips us properly. They allow us to have training to do what we need to do and to stay ahead of the curve on a lot of things. And that's some of the things you're going to learn as a panel of many things that we're already doing and that we have in place. So ultimately it lies on my shoulders to make sure that this town is safe and it's a responsibility that I certainly don't take lightly. I have a lot of sleepless nights actually over it. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm looking forward to working with everybody on the panel. And I, I think it's, it, it, I want it to come from me as well that I want everybody on this panel to, to be comfortable and to be able to speak freely and not have to worry about um, saying anything that, you know, there's no stupid questions here, right? Um, if you don't know, ask. This is the opportunity to ask. If you've heard something in the community or maybe you've heard something in your family or you have a general question, 
this is the time and the opportunity to bring it forward. Okay, and I want everybody to feel very comfortable with that. All right, today's meeting, we're kind of laying the groundwork for the future meetings. So one of the things I'm gonna do is go over the police department and our functions, and it's gonna be kind of a brief outline of what we do. Um, but rest assured, we're gonna go deeply into some of these aspects that the governor's asked us to do. And I want you to understand that um, you'll have, by the time these meetings are done, you're gonna have a very deep working knowledge of what the police department is and what we do every day. Cause I don't think in general, you know, people know the police, they see us driving around, maybe they'll call us once in a while if they need some assistance. Um, but when you actually truly sit down and hear what we do every day, and it's, it's quite impressive that we're a very lucky community to have the police department. So I think from there, I'm gonna go into the outline of the police department, but I want you to know I'm committed to making any changes, any recommendations that this panel has. Uh, we have council members on board. We have the town supervisor on board here and me. And so change is gonna be very easy to bring to the police department uh, should this panel find things to bring in that need change. Okay, so I want you to understand this is the catalyst for that change to happen. Okay, I'm gonna go into just, a, just an outline of the police department, who we are. So our roots go back, um, believe it or not, all the way to about 1763 when the town was formed and we had six constables. All right, I'm not gonna talk a lot about that, obviously, but we became a full-time police department in 1965. We're a full-time police agency. We do not have any part-time police officers and we provide 24 hour coverage to the town. Part of that, we also have a dispatch center, which we, have, we employ our own dispatchers that dispatch for fire and ambulance. We're located right at town hall. So a little bit about New Windsor. I think most of you know probably this. We're 37 square miles. Uh, according to a 2010 census, 28,000 people in the town. Uh, demographics of the makeup of the town is about 69% white, 14% black, 23% Hispanic population, and about 4% Asian. As far as our police officers go, we have 48 police officers right now. We have one retiring on Monday. 39 males, three females. We have one black officer three Hispanic officers and two Asian officers. So we'll we'll dive a little deeper into that in some later discussions. We also have nine full-time dispatchers, two full-time record clerks, and one full-time police chief secretary, and six part-time dispatchers as well. So we have roughly about 66 employees with the town. Sometimes people are kind of, um, it's kind of eye-opening to see how, how large the police department is here in New Windsor. Um, and you'll see when we get to our call volume, you'll understand why we have so many people. So we have a patrol division. Our patrol division consists of about 36 patrol officers and patrol sergeants. And they're, they're our, really our first responders. They're the ones that are out on the street at all times, 24 hours of the day, regardless of uh, the time of day or the weather conditions, they're out there answering calls. And again, they're answering calls that are basically anything that the town is in need of. So if it's a traffic accident, a medical emergency, a crime in progress, a fire, a domestic, a mental health event, um, they're the ones that are there first. And yes, they do go on most ambulance calls and most fires, because again, they're the ones that are out in the field and they're the ones primarily getting there first um, to render aid first. And, and I think um, when we get into some, some more demographics and deeply into the minutia of this, you'll see We'll get into some numbers, how many lives have been saved that they're credited with saving in just the past couple of years um, by getting there first and rendering aid and CPR and, and those kind of things. So they're, the, they're really the first line of defense for the town. So when something's happening, either they're gonna pick up on it or they're gonna get a call and they're gonna be the ones answering the call. Okay, we also have eight detectives. Our detective division is made up of a sergeant, an ID detective who is our primary evidence technician clerk. He's the one that gathers evidence, takes photographs, processes evidence, and, and those kind of things. And they are, our detectives are extremely skilled. I'm sure you saw news articles about them, um, whether it had been for anything from the level of a homicide 
um, all the way down to um, anything that they can get in, whether it be the holiday patrols that we just did around um, the holidays in December. They were out on patrol and unmarked cars, ensuring that the public was safe while they were doing their, their shopping around Bales Gate. So they're out there doing their job as well very hard. A lot of things they do is they're free to be able to follow up on investigations where the patrol division is still going on additional calls. They're free and available. So they follow up and do interviews. They work closely with the district attorney's office and in, in formulating their complaints. And they're really invaluable for the service that they provide because our patrol division is very busy and they, they allow us to still be able to go out and collect that evidence, whether it be um, video evidence or fingerprint evidence, DNA, um, interrogations, and, and, and such. So eight of those, we have two canine unit officers in the patrol division as well. Our canine unit goes back to as far as 1986 when it was first formed. Um, in the history of the town, we've had 14 canine teams. We just had one graduate. Uh, you may have seen if you follow any of the town social media just recently from a narcotics school. So our dogs are really a great part of our community policing aspect because the dogs, I think, really help draw in the community and draw in children to be able to have break that ice between the officer and the community. And, and there's nothing better than you know a dog to do that for sure. So, so some of the things we've had bomb dogs in the past. We don't currently have one, um, but we do have narcotics dogs. Um, they're also patrol certified, which means they're able to go out and be able to locate evidence. Should it be in a you know in a field or a lost person? Should we've had we've had cases where elderly people have wandered off, whether it be into the woods or uh, maybe a marshy area, and the dog's been able to find those individuals. So they're really invaluable and, and we're, we're very proud to have our, our canines on board with us as part of their team. So another unit we have with the uh, police department is our traffic safety unit. Consists of about six officers whose primary focus is traffic safety in the town. Um, as if you've driven through town anytime uh, recently, you see the volume of traffic that there is out there. And there are a lot of collisions, a lot of accidents, and their mission is to go out and try to prevent those accidents from happening um, by traffic enforcement and education with the public. Um, so that's a lot of what they do. They also go into, as you know, we occasionally have some serious accidents in town. And one of their uh, training missions is to be able to investigate those serious accidents, whether it's a serious injury or a fatality involved they're able to go out and do their own investigation. We're not reliant on any other department to do, do those type of investigations. We have the equipment, we have the training to go out and do those measurements and, and make those calculations on those in-depth investigations as far as those go. So a little data on the traffic safety unit um, and accidents in 2019, we had 1,026 accidents in 2019. 2020 was significantly less with about 708 accidents. Um, with the pandemic going on, there was less vehicular traffic and, and therefore less collisions. So um, quite oftentimes you'll see them out and about. And you see, we have a lot of the traffic signs out now, the electronic signs, you might see them throughout town. Some of them are portable, some of them are actually fixed up on the signs. They're responsible for those items as well. And the data that those collect and us being able to make decisions and when enforcement is necessary and the best times of day to do that kind of enforcement. Um, we have a communications division here as well. I'm gonna get into that. That's gonna be one of the aspects we're gonna go a little more in depth into tonight. Um, so I'll skip that for now. We have a community policing unit, which is very active. I know uh, many people on the panel have had played some role or have seen the community policing unit out, whether have been at community day or many of the other events that they've done and with what be in the schools or out in the community in general, just in talking to kids or at private businesses. Where they go out, um, they focus on many different programs in the community as far as keeping uh, tasks and students, you know, bullying seminars in the schools 
or just uh, spreading the good nature of the department. Um, one of the th big things they also do is the youth camps that go on during the summer out at Christy Babcock Park. They go out and speak to the youth that are out there. And, and, and there's, there's literally dozens or even probably close to hundreds of kids out there at the time and when they go out and speak. So that's another, and we'll go deeper into the community policing aspect as we um, divulge through our, our purpose here. Um, we have a CIT unit, which is a crisis intervention team uh, that was formed back uh, a few years ago in 2008. 100% um, of our department is trained, including myself in crisis intervention. Um, you might've heard that that's kind of a, <laughs> that's getting used quite a bit um, as of recently as last year. We were, we were ahead of the curve. I can't wait to do the, the outline and the profile of our, what our team does and how they were formed and how we took advantage of a lot of grant money on that to form and our policy and what we're doing proactively to address the needs of the community as far as uh, mental health concerns are, are cuz that that's become a very big part of what the patrol officers are doing and it's not uncommon for a simple 8 hour shift to have three or four calls um, regarding people in mental health crisis whether it be uh, people in, in, in need or people that are suicidal um, it's it's amazing how many calls we receive uh, of that nature right here in New Windsor and and we're I'm very proud of that program, and that's something we're certainly outlining. Um, officers and schools. So we have five public schools in New Windsor. Of those five public schools, one of them is a Washingtonville Central School District school. It's an elementary school, Little Britain. You might know it over on 207. We have an officer assigned to that school on a full-time basis when children are in the school. That school district reimburses us his salary for that time that he is in the school. That's something we're very proud of, and that's something we'll speak more about um, because it's been an extremely successful program. Um, and that's from the feedback that I've gotten from the superintendent of schools to the principal, to the teachers, to the parents. And uh, Officer Pierce, who's part of the panel here with us, is our certainly our key player there. Um, and he was chosen specifically to do that, and he's, he's done an outstanding job as far as that goes, for sure. So I'm looking forward to that talk as well. But we do have a big presence as well in the Newburgh schools. So we have four Newburgh schools in New Windsor. We unfortunately do not have officers assigned to those schools. That's something we'll talk about later on. Um, but certainly they do have security meetings in which I attend. They have them monthly, as well as the Washington School District does have security meetings as well um, that I attend. And it's something certainly on the forefront uh, of, of what we do here. And it's something that I've done and been heavily involved in since I've been a sergeant is school safety. So it's, we'll talk uh, much more in, in depth about that as well. Um, since becoming police chief, there's been some, some things that we've taken on and moved forward with and, and really moved forward with, I think is, is an understatement. So we've, we've instituted an employee assistance program. We instituted that in April of 2020. We'll talk more in depth about that and the services that are provided to our police officers here in New Windsor. Um, as you can imagine, the job of being a police officer is a very stressful job. It's an ever-changing job. It's a demanding job. And there are times where our officers need assistance, whether it be in their personal lives, or whether it be after handling that that call that just is a very could be very emotionally damaging. Um, so we've we've taken steps to ensure the mental health of our people here, and I think um, we have some mental health professionals on this panel, and I, I'm sure they understand, and maybe they could even speak on it as well. And I think that's a, a very a good program that I'm proud of that I was able to start. Another program we became involved in in July of 2020 was Hope Not Handcuffs. Um, you, I'm sure you've probably seen a lot of the press in regards to that. That's a program where we here at the police department are, are trained in anybody that comes into the police department, whether they come into the lobby or we come across people in the community, we now have the resources in place to be able to get them either placed or at least the assistance that they need for addiction problems. Because as you know, addiction problems 
are a huge issue in the community right now. And it doesn't matter where you live. It doesn't matter your economic makeup of where of personal nature. It can affect anybody at any time. It's affected my personal family. And it's something that I certainly take to heart. It's a great program. Uh, we're going to outline that uh, more as well. And our partnership with Open My Handcuffs is something that we started um, under a year ago. And it's something that I um, is very also near and dear to my heart. Uh, moving forward from there, let me give a, just a, some statistics. And again, I'm not going to go too in depth, but just to give you an idea of some of the, the call volume and how busy we are as an agency. So our calls for service, so this would be the calls that the police officers went on. So it, it doesn't matter if it was an officer initiated, say like a traffic stop, or if it was a call that came into headquarters that the police officers had to respond to. So in 2019, we had very near 25,000. So 24,928 calls for service. So that's extremely busy for a town agency. 2020, our call volume went down again, for obvious reasons, we answered about 18,166 calls. And those calls vary, like I said, they could be a barking dog complaint all the way up to, unfortunately in 2019, um, a homicide, a call. So they vary, they could be anything at any time and we need to be prepared. We have another data uh, set that we go by, it's called cases, so anytime someone calls the police department and it initiates a police response, an ambulance response or a fire response, it creates what's called a blotter. And it's a re it's the beginning of a record we, and we start entering location data, name data and any other pertinent information into that, uh, that computer entry. If it becomes more than that, if it becomes a crisis intervention team or if it becomes a domestic incident or if it becomes an arrest or if it becomes something more serious, we generate something that's called a case. And that entails a little more paperwork for the officers, but that's how we track our information here. So in 2019, we had 3,144 cases. 2020, that number went down to about 2,301 cases. As far as arrest data go, and we're going to go much deeper into the arrest data, but just number wise, um, you'll see in 2019, we had about 1,611 arrests in New Windsor. And that's always a shocking number for everybody, um, no matter who you are. When I when I say yes, in 2019, we had 1,611 arrests. That's an eye-opening experience. And again, that's also anything from a town code violation of maybe a loose dog running loose, all the way up to, as you could imagine, a serious assault or, or something of that nature, or a DWI. With the law reform that occurred in 2020, and also the pandemic, those numbers dropped about 70%. And that's something we'll talk about as well in the future. But for 2020, we had 528 arrests, much less. Juvenile arrests, juvenile arrests are low and they continue to be low, which I think is a good thing. I think it shows that um, the youths in the area are, staying out of trouble, right? I mean, how else can you summarize it but that? We're not put in positions where they are doing things where we need to either get them into family court or get them into criminal court, depending on the serious nature of, of whatever they would be charged with. So in 2019, we only had uh, six juvenile arrests. In 2020, we only had three. So that's certainly a prom those are certainly promising numbers. So that's a that's a rough outline of what the police department does. I think it gives you a good working knowledge of what we do here. Um, one other aspect that I do want to talk about is accreditation. So the police department is state accredited, and I think that's important um, aspect being that you know the state has asked us, the governor's office has asked us to go review our policies and procedures. One of the things that accreditation is all about is our policies and procedures. And we have these policies in place because they're best practices. So very, just kind of summarize it up. Um, 
New York State offers a, it's a free program and it's a voluntary program. The police department doesn't have to participate in accreditation, uh, but we do. And, and so far back that we've, uh, our first accreditation was in uh, 1996. So we've been doing this uh, for quite a long time. It's essentially keeps our policies up to date with best practices in the law enforcement profession. There's 110 standards that the state says we need to meet with our policies. So that is in place. That's what we do on a regular basis. Those uh, performance standards that the state measures us up against are certainly in uh, administrative uh, policies, training policies. They they tell us how much training and what kind of training we need to do, and we certainly ex exceed what the state has asked. And it also gets into our best practice of operations. So we're up for accreditation actually in March. It's been five years since we've been reaccredited, so we're going to have an assessor on scene here. Uh, we're looking forward to that. So they're going to be coming here to do a compliance audit and an inspection. And what that basically entails is they come, they inspect our building, they inspect our equipment, they talk to our staff, they talk to our police officers, they talk to our detectives, they talk to our administrative members, and, and they verify through word of mouth that we are doing what we say we're doing and we're doing what the policies say we're supposed to be doing. In addition to that, they also inspect our files. So we have to keep files here for every single year that we're accredited following those standards. So we have to prove to them, not only through word of mouth, but through files and paperwork that we're doing what we say we're doing. And I think that's a good credit for this police department because it shows that we're meeting the best practices standards of the state already as we head into this panel. So we're certainly going into this panel with an open mind, but at the same time, according to the state, we're doing a good job at what we're doing based on our accreditation status. So I'll give you an example. So the state is part of a, one accreditation standard of the 110 says we have to have a policy on hate crimes. So if we have a hate crime, we have to abide by that policy. We have to make sure we investigate it properly according to our standard. We have to make sure we establish that motive according to our standard. We have to report it accordingly and prove that we do that. So that's something we take a lot of pride in. Um, before the accreditation standards um, came into effect across the state, and again, not all the departments do it, but you would see a lot of stories, whether it be in the media or press of, you know, evidence going missing or money missing from a police department. And having these policies and practices in place really eliminates that possibility from happening. So that's just, just another example of what accreditation does for us. And we're, we'll go deeply a little more into training as well later on in this, uh, in this panel discussion, but I wanted to talk about accreditation because I think it's important. And, and we're certainly here to answer any questions that you may have about accreditation. And I'll, I'll turn it back over to the panel chair at this time. All right, thank you, Robert. <clears throat> Listen, I think some of the things that you're hearing tonight kind of just giving you an idea of what the police department is. You know, how many officers you have, the detectives, what they do, the calls that we get. So we're kind of relatively busy police department. And some of the things that I think that we're going to talk about in the subsequent weeks coming will be a little more meaty, like use of force. That's always been an issue for me. I've spent some time in internal affairs in the state police. So use of force has become to the forefront recently, but for me, it's been going on for almost my entire adult life, supervising troopers and use of force. Um, personnel complaints has been another issue that's to the forefront all of a sudden, but the state police have been involved in this kind of stuff for many, many, many years. And it's, it's, it's evolved. And it's, it's very important that you believe people when they come in. So I've always said to anybody who's worked for me or around me is, listen, when they come in, talk to them right away, write down what they say right now. And no matter how crazy it sounds, get it down on paper so we can kind of take a hard look at it. And I think it's important that people like myself and the police chief kind of put that message out there. You know, we, we if there's a personnel complaint, we want to look at it and we want to see if there's something that we've done wrong, and if there's something that we've done wrong, we're going to correct it. And I've always been one that 
if we need to take some disciplinary action against somebody, I have no problem doing that. So that kind of is, I, I think, at some point in time, we're going to get into those kind of things. Training is very important. Like I was with the uh, police chief and a couple of his administrative people today. We were looking at some of the new body cams and some of the footage that we have now since we put this trial into place in the last 24 hours, this trial period. And there was a couple of instances there where you could kind of see that this could have turned into something more, although the police officer was well trained and it didn't. And one of the one of the supervisors said to me, well, come on, tell me in the late 60s and 70s, it would end it like that? No, it wouldn't end it like that. We weren't as well trained and it would have been a lot more physical action going on. These cops today are better trained. I spent probably nine years training new recruits in the State Police Academy. I was the officer in charge of training and breaking them in for the 26 weeks that they were there and they were there Monday to Friday all day long, they didn't go home. So the training has kind of stepped up and, 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 and these young cops today are getting a whole lot more training than we ever got. So I think those are the kind of things that I'm interested in, use of force, personnel complaints. Are, are we doing things that people understand why we're doing? And it's important to, to me, like a lot of people became aware of this kind of whole police issue with George Floyd. The poor guy that they were kneeling on his neck for 18 minutes. So when I looked at that video and, and I read about it, and the first thing that popped into my mind was, wow, who was the sergeant? Well, it took him 18 minutes to get there. So I, I have always said that that's the most important position in any police department, and the chief alluded to it before. But I'm pretty rough on people here on overtime. I kind of really watch what we're doing in overtime. And one of my first kind of orders to the police department, there was no sergeant on every ship. And I asked the chief why, and he said, well, you know, the overtime. I said, no, I don't care what the overtime is. I want a sergeant on every shift because that person, he or she, is responsible for what goes on. And if there had been a sergeant there with George Floyd, I guarantee you that they wouldn't have been kneeling on his neck for 18 minutes. And if the police chief was a real police chief, and this guy, this officer had 17 personnel complaints in 18 years, he wouldn't have been there anymore. So there's reasons why things happen. And I think what we are trying to do here is to ensure that we are doing the very best that we can to prevent those things from happening. And you cannot, it's like a goalie. You cannot stop all of the pucks going into the net. But the police chief, myself, uh, we attempt to stop as many as we possibly can. Um, I think at a point I just put up with the police a lot during the day. I review their police blotter every morning with the police chief or our deputy police chief, Mike Farben, who's, who's on with us tonight, too. And we go over everything that happened in town. Could be a domestic dispute, could be car break-ins, could be a burglary. So we're kind of talking about what's going on within our town because we're all kind of like invested in what goes on here. I live here. My children have lived here. My grandchildren have lived here. So I'm pretty much invested in what goes on in this town. But we see it, and sometimes I refer to me as the police because I've been there so many years of my adult life. Sometimes we don't see what the average citizen sees and maybe sees it different than we see. So in that respect, I think this is a pretty good idea to get people involved, to kind of see what, what they perceived to be happening and perception is reality in my mind if someone perceives it then it's a reality for them so we have kind of instituted a lot of things like everybody else we stopped the chokehold you know these things we uh, the body cameras the training you know we, we're trying to catch up but i have looked at their accreditation i was the one who was here in 1996 when we got the accreditation the first time and it was important to me that we do it because i was an assessor when this first came into play in new york state so I knew how important it was. But that, that means someone outside is coming to look at what we're doing. So police chiefs or state police um, supervisors from throughout the state come and see, what is the New Windsor Police Department doing? Are they doing these things right? So it's good for someone outside to look, up, look at us and say, hey, how about this? How about that? So of course, like most people, we think, yeah, we're 100%. We got it all covered. We're, we're doing the best we possibly can. But 
always need a good set of eyes, another set of eyes on to see what we're doing. Robert touched on a lot of things. Hope not. Handcuffs is great. The CIT, which is the mental health involvement that we're involved in, and he'll go into that in, in a lot of detail later, that that is a lot of what we do. There's a lot of general orders that go out to the police officers, and all these orders go out, and it does box the police officer in. Like there's a arena that he has to stay in or she has to stay in, and if they go outside that, then that's where the administrative staff, the police chief and, and his deputy police and his lieutenants, they step in. So that's their job to make sure that their officers are performing at their highest level and not only treating the public fairly, but also ensuring that they do their jobs good. Okay, We want to make sure that everybody's getting in good shape. So I think that when we get into these other things that I, I would suspect that there'd be a lot of more interaction from you folks as to how you see it. Um, I thought tonight would just be a good idea to kind of get a little overview for you to see about the police department. And then the police chief has kind of set some things he wants to do in the second and third and fourth week, and then we'll kind of open it up a little bit. And I think the intention is to put this meeting someplace out there, right? Online. I mean, I'll talk to our resident expert here, John McDonough from IT, who doesn't have my name right. But <laughs> are we going to put this where? On the website? We can, uh, we'll set up a, a section for it. We'll put it up on a website. And it'll be, uh, we'll have to download to YouTube because we're not streaming live to Facebook right now. Um, like a town board meeting. So if we did that, it would be immediately available. Um, I think at some point the discussion was to start streaming on Facebook, but we'll put this out on YouTube so anybody can view it. Yeah, I want the public, the general public, because there's, there's the, whatever there is, a bus, 15, 20 of us, but I want everybody to see what we're talking about and, and, and how we want to get to an end here that improves what we do and kind of have the public be secure knowing that this police department is doing the very best that they can to keep them safe. And I know Sylvia is on the town board, and that's really the first order of business for any government official is to provide a safe environment for your residents and taxpayers. So I think that's what we try to do. So I think that that's all that I had for tonight. And I just kind of open up to any of you folks, so if you want to bring anything out. And I think what I asked the police chief to do was some of these videos from the body cams that I saw today, we're going to send them to you. So you'll see what what transpired in some of these interactions with, with people in the public. And we can kind of use that maybe as a jump off next week to talk about some of these body cams. And it's brand new. I mean, we're probably in it for the first 24 hours. But there was a couple of interactions that I could see. And I go back to my days when I was a road trooper that things would have been handled a lot different. So like everything else, things have improved in law enforcement. You know, and I, I've been around for seven decades in this and watched what goes on. And from back in the 60s to the 2020, there's been a huge difference. And lots of people left law enforcement because they couldn't make those adjustments. And the adjustments have been made and they will continue to be made. So I think that uh, the chief will make sure that he gets a couple of these things out to you when we can look at, you'll have looked at them and maybe we can start a discussion next week about them. And anything else that, that you've heard tonight that you would want to talk about a clarification? And some of the issues that I talked about, this personnel business and the use of force, is really to me is, is how we treat the public. Once again, we. How the police treat the public is very important. I used to kind of teach a course in, in, in that community uh, interaction. And let's just start treating the person that you're dealing with as if they were your relative, OK? Until they give you a reason not to. But I think you start off being like, okay, I'm here to help you. What's the problem? So it's become much more involved now. All right. And I think that we are trying our very best to provide the best service that we can. But we're looking for some input from public, from the public. And most importantly, you folks who have agreed to kind of volunteer your time to try to understand what we're doing. And most people do not understand what the police do. Many times they'll do a ride, a ride around or ride on, whatever they call it. People become away with a whole different view of what goes on in that police car. And most of the time in police patrol work, it's boring. Really not a lot going on. 
but every once in a while something's happening that could change your entire life or somebody else's life so once they take these ride arounds and see uh ride alongs ride alongs like okay, they see what the, the police officer deals with people have a a uh, newfound knowledge of what they do and that's what i think we're trying to tell you what they do and now get some input from you as to where you think we should go so that being said does it anybody want to offer anything about tonight or where you think we should go in the subsequent weeks okay so chief am i right about that you're going to send out a few things to these folks on their body cams Yes, I'll get that done and I'll send an agenda for the next meeting as well. Okay, so I guess, let's see. That's pretty Excuse good. Me, just, I, go, go ahead. Excuse me, I do have a comment. Yes, sir. And, uh, I'm sincerely impressed with um, the openness of this meeting. And I came away that there was sincerity of purpose. The second point that I uh, that impressed me was your concern about not only the public but your how you treat your officers. And uh, I've had interaction with several of your officers, and I say that from a positive perspective because I live in Butter Hill, and a number of your office, officers grew up in the neighborhood. As a matter of fact, came to my door trick or treating. So, as a long term resident, it is uh, hopeful and I'm impressed with the town's approach, not only for the public's welfare, but the welfare of your officers. So, thank you. No, I appreciate that comment. And we are, I'm a little tough on some things, but we are absolutely. Positively committed, and I say we, I mean in the Wintertown Board, to giving the police officers the equipment and the training that they need to do their job professionally. And I think they know that. I mean, they, they're out there every day. It's hard to do your job no matter who you are or what you do if you don't have the proper equipment. So we are pretty much committed, not pretty much, we are committed to giving them everything they need to do their job. So I appreciate that comment. and. Uh, if no one else has anything, I kind of get to like my attention span gets shrinks and shrinks. Like when I get around an hour, I kind of get off into a tangent. So anybody have anything else? I'd like to make a few comments if you don't mind. Sylvia. Yes, that's me. Thank you. Um, I, I want to say that I really appreciate your comment before saying that sometimes you don't always see what other people see. I think sharing the uh, body cam footages or offering to share them, I think, is a great way to start uh, because I think we can, you know, see different perspectives and so forth. Uh, and two, a question for Chief uh, Doss, not now, but later on, if you had a wish list to make any changes, uh, nothing major, obviously, but even then, you know, what would they be? What do you think could be done better? I mean, you guys are doing a terrific job. Thank you for outlining everything. But you know what? There's always room for improvement. What, based on your experiences, could we do better? And can you share that, you know, at another meeting? At another meeting. Thank you. Sylvia doesn't mean to spend a lot of money, Robert. Some I some things that we don't have to spend a lot of taxpayer money on. Okay. okay. Well, you know what? There's also grants out there, uh, you know, and, and so forth. And I don't know if, again, that's something else that we can help with. So, uh, okay. how do we, you know, how do we work smarter, not harder? Thank you. All right, Sylvia. Thanks. I've so just to answer a question, not in depth, but just in my research and preparation for these meetings, I've already identified six things that I think we could work on with the community to make us better. So, and that's just in my research before the panel has even met. So, I'm really looking forward to the plan that we're going to put forward to the public to comment on. So, we're already ahead of the curve, I think, on that. So, thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. We'll see you next Thursday at 7 p.m. Thank you. John McConnell. Oh, listen, Dave Zagon, Dave Zagon was with us tonight, the town attorney. I want to just tell Dave thanks for tuning in, Dave. No problem. Okay. Thanks, George. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, everybody.